Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts, losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. This is broadcast number 200 of The Thinking Atheist radio podcast. A day that I have the honor of sharing with the atheist community of Tulsa. You know what's amazing is doing an atheist radio show in this town, right? You guys know what it's like to be in Jesus Town. (laughs) How far are we from Oral Roberts University? What, uh, about 10 minutes? We got Rhema Bible Training Center. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches. And here we are. We are like the black sheep. You guys know that feeling? And then we come together and then we get a chance to sort of hang out and pat each other on the back and remind each other that, yes, there is hope for the species after all. So I'm glad you guys showed up. Tonight's uh, broadcast is brought to you by NatureBox, shipping great tasting and wholesome snacks right to your door. Just forget the vending machine and snack smarter with wholesome, delicious treats like banana bread granola. Support this show. You order a a free NatureBox sampler box, naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. NatureBox.com slash Thinking Atheist. Now, before we get into the actual meat of the broadcast, my friends at NatureBox heard we were having a little party. And they brought goodies for everybody. Now, I'm not going to hand these out now because the last thing I want on the radio for 90 minutes is, is that sound, all right? But NatureBox has been absolutely fantastic to support this show. For the listener support through NatureBox, it's just been awesome. They have a website with hundreds of delicious and healthy snacks, over a hundred nutritionist approved snacks with something for everybody, zero artificial colors, flavors, or sweeteners, zero grams trans fats, no high fructose corn syrup. Log on, check it out, and get yours today. NatureBox.com slash Thinking Atheist. And a big thanks again for sort of feeding the group here on our 200th episode. NatureBox.com slash Thinking Atheist. You guys been following the story of uh, Pastor Ryan Bell, former pastor Ryan Bell? Yeah. He is a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor. He was an atheist for all of last year, or he lived as an atheist, and he made that announcement last December. Have you guys followed the story? Yes. And so what inevitably happens, I say almost inevitably happens, when someone decides they're going to step out of the religious cocoon and starts testing the outer boundaries of their religion? Well, Ryan Bell said he absolutely cannot hold to a deity. He doesn't call himself an atheist, but Ryan Bell has come out of that journey and said, I just don't see enough evidence to convince me that there's a God and he is walking away from his religion. He will be my guest on next week's radio broadcast. And we're going to hear from his own mouth. I mean, it's terrifying. How many of you came from religion? Can I see a show of hands? For those on the radio, it's pretty much 90% of the room, which makes this like a self-help meeting, right? (laughs) We'll talk to Ryan Bell coming up next week in a very special broadcast. The week after that, we're going to do a show called I'm Offended. (laughs) Now, have you guys heard that in conversation? You'll say something about religion, and it might be a lampoon of religious belief. It might be satire. It might be sarcasm. It might be an insult. Or it might just be, hey, check out this link about the evidence, and someone comes back and says, I find this offensive. And we're going to talk about what is and isn't offensive, what should and should not be offensive. Should we ever get offended? And so I think that's going to be an interesting show that's coming up here in a few weeks. I want this show to really be about what you think. 
I want this show to be about the opinions of our listeners, the questions of our listeners. And since we have a live in studio audience, what an honor. If there's something that's going on in the world that you want to talk about, there's something in the headlines that you want to deal with. If there's some fire in your belly and you'd like to get it off your chest, a question you want to ask, whatever. I have a microphone right here. You can line up right over there and I'll just say, hey, come on up and just give us what you have. Okay, don't be shy. There's nothing to be afraid of. You are in a safe place here, my friends. Okay. Any takers? You got to come up. You don't have to applaud Stan just for being Stan. I know that's a natural inclination. All right, hit me, Captain. Are we really as much of a minority as we think we are? Do I think we are as much a minority? Well, I think we're surrounded by apatheists. There are people who may invoke God in casual conversation if it's brought up by somebody else, but it is an absolute nothing in their lives. They don't attend church. They don't know the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They don't watch Christian programming. They don't listen to Christian music. They don't do anything religious, but they keep God sort of back here in the back pocket and say, yeah, sure, whatever. Now, if an accident happens tomorrow, do they drop to their knees and speak to God and call down his healing power? Or do they grab a cell phone and call 911? Of course, they, like almost everybody else, calls 911. I think what we have is statistically, we see a, a small number of atheists, anti theists, but I think we're seeing a rising number of sort of apatheists, people who are like, ah, oh, whatever. And I'll tell you, the 30 and under crowd, they're not freaked out at all about the stuff that our mom and dads were freaked out about. Did you guys come from that where it was, I mean, talk about sex with your parents? Geez, don't even get me started. And uh, homosexuality, non heterosexuality was scandalous. Uh, now young people are like, you know, hey, live and be happy, man. Drug use, marijuana, right? Now it's being legalized in states all over the union. Back then, if you had weed, you might as well be, you know, on a slippery slope straight to the depths of hell, right? It's a cultural shift. What alarms me and, and troubles me a little bit is this apathyism doesn't really answer the fact that religion is a well-organized, well-funded propaganda machine on a mission. So it doesn't help us if someone says, yeah, you know, I don't really care. I don't really believe because those people are going to get steamrolled by those who are out there absolutely running and gunning, especially for the young and the vulnerable. So while I do see an increase in non-belief happening, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're not going to see enough people out there swinging for the fences. You know, Does that answer your question, Stan? Well, have you seen the latest pew poll of the religious makeup of the 114th Congress. Uh, well, it's alarmingly 114th high. 114th Congress. For those who don't live in the United States, we just had a, a midterm election, and the, uh, the Congress is overwhelmingly, it, it seems to me, almost overwhelmingly theocrat. If you could, if we, assuming we couldn't get any more to the right in terms of, uh, uh, how should I say, Christian dominionism, we're up from like 91 point uh, two percent to to ninety two point six percent, or like one point four, one point eight percent increase in the number of Christians representing us in our government. Well, picture a picture a big hall filled with Michelle Bachmans. You know, is is kind of what is kind of the horror story that comes to mind. So. Hey, she seems like one of the milder ones now. That frightens me. That frightens me. Well, you know, there are, and, and this is unpopular to say, there are some people who are fiscal conservatives who are atheists. Uh, you know, Dr. Robert M. Price is an example. The guy's a genius. He is a fiscal conservative, takes a lot of heat for being a fiscal conservative out there. But I would say, by and large, the Republican Party has a real, 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 real problem. And by default, then, so do the rest of us, seeing how much power they wield. David Neosi just released a new book on this very subject. Damn it, I can't remember the title of the book, but just look up David Niosi, N-I-O-S-E, brand new book that talks about the challenges that we have. Oh, it's called Fighting Back the Right. And uh, I would encourage you guys to check that out. Thank you, Stan. Appreciate you, man. Hey, this is Peter Bogosian from Portland State University. Congratulations to Seth on his 200th podcast. Hi, this is JT Eberhard from the What Would JT Do blog, and I want to give a big congratulations to probably my favorite atheist podcast, The Thinking Atheist. Congratulations, Seth. 
Tell me your first name. Uh, it's Tuck, like Friar Tuck. What's going on, bro? Well, you were talking about swinging for the fences, and I get I get told a lot, you should shut up, you ought to keep that to yourself. You know, I don't want to hear that that atheist talk. I've heard that at work before, believe it or not. And I'm just wondering, how, how do you respond to this? What are some things I could say or talk about? Because I just, I feel like I freeze up sometimes. I go, man, I don't want to get into it with this person, but at the same time, I feel like I'm being silenced. Like, I should just... You guys ever feel that way? Well, give me some context. I mean, is it that you're in a religious environment? Are the people around you throwing Jesus at you? or? Okay, I, I'm a server. That's what I do. And anyway, a lot of people at my job, they're friends with me on Facebook or they know me because I'm a fairly gregarious person. So they know that I don't believe. This is not something that I'll ever keep to myself. If somebody says, you know, have you heard the word of God? I'll say, yeah, I've heard that bedtime story before. Yes. <laughs> but, and that happened to me at, at uh, this mall and right around the corner a couple days ago. Anyway, so I'll, I'll start talking about it or somebody will ask me like, what do you think? And this guy walks up behind me and goes, don't start with that atheist talk. Don't you start with that. And I said, oh, but if I was talking about the Jeebus, that would be all right. That would be cool. But, but I'm, I'm saying I don't believe and I ought to shut up. Are you kidding yeah. me? Yeah. So, well, you know, in the workplace, it is a little bit difficult. Um, I myself think there is a time and a place. You know, if if I'm being myself in company of uh, friends or strangers, and someone tells me that I can't speak out or speak up or voice an opinion, but they can, that's obviously crap. You know, I think when you're in an office environment, there are many factors that we have to consider. You know. Is this a platform for my personal belief or non-belief? Is this what I'm being paid to do? Right. And uh, I think there's a way in an office environment to let people know that you are a skeptic, you are a free thinker, without in any way betraying the obligation that you have to an employer. People will always try to shut you down. Have you guys experienced, hey, look, don't even bother me. I don't care what you say. I will never, ever turn away from my Jesus kind of deal. And uh, that's a conversation stopper. That's what it's designed to be. Now, I think if you're speaking to people in a place where you're not actually betraying the role that you're supposed to have, the paid obligation that you have as an employee, but you're just hanging out in the lunchroom, you're talking at the water cooler, you're talking about your life. Dude, I think you can tell them anything you want, who you are, what you did. And if they're not interested, they don't have to listen. They don't have to be a part of you. They don't have to be a part of your life. I do think it's important for us to keep in mind that we'll never browbeat someone else into an epiphany. This is a saying that I often have. It's not enough to be right. We also have to be effective. So if somebody's there and I go over and I start pounding the drum right in front of them, God, your religion is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I may be right in point of fact, but if I'm in the arena to change minds, am I being effective? I was talking to Dr. Ryan Cragen on the radio shortly, uh, what was it, three or four weeks ago, and he was talking about how actually debate is not the best way to change minds. They have discovered that changing one's social circle is a great way to sort of make inroads toward reason. So if you hang out with religious people all the time, you're going to be reinforced. But if you start to see people who are skeptics, free thinkers, agnostics, atheists in your circle, and you see more of them, you hear more of them, they become your friends, they become your associates, they become woven into the fabric of your life, before you know it, now we start to see some inroads made. We start to see some, some muting of the uh, sort of the evangelical tone, and maybe they start to genuinely ask questions. I think it's about balance. We're playing chess, not checkers. I wouldn't overcompensate by trying to hit him over the head with it. If I were you, I'd just be subtle and cool about it. If they know what you think and why you think it, dude, that's plenty. And in the meantime, you can find support with groups like this, okay? Excellent point. Thank you. I don't know. I mean, you guys check me on that. I mean, what would you do? Would you go in and say, you know, hey, the religion you guys are talking about has been long disproven. The Bible is absolute crap. It's a contradictory and immoral mess, blah, blah, blah. I mean, would you guys do that that way? Or would you do it a different way? Or would you just shut up until the five o'clock bell and you got home or you got out of there and, and use another venue? I mean, I'd be curious about that. Come on up. Tell me your first name again. Larry. Larry. Uh, Seth, <clears throat> I don't know about anybody else, but uh, I'm sure that you guys are familiar with the, uh, the uh, representative that's trying to introduce in, in the Oklahoma legislature uh, where they can 
the, the schools can start teaching the Bible as history as an elective. Uh, just kind of wondered what your thoughts were on that and everything. I've, I've had some people say that, well, uh, maybe the best way to, to get more atheists is to have them read the Bible. And that was, that was uh, William's. <clears throat> that was William's point this morning. I talked to him on the way up. Yeah. Uh, the, he told me to tell you hi, by the way, and he wished he could be here if he had to work. Awesome. So. All right. Well, uh, I mean, how do you read the Bible? Are you, if you read it objectively, sure. If you read it like a cherry-picked love letter uh, and you've already predetermined you're going to believe what you read and skip the stuff that's inconvenient. I mean, you know, I, I want to know if, if the Texas Board of Education just migrated north. That just sounds insane, but it does unfortunately sound a little bit like Oklahoma. And I think that's where, again, I lament the apatheist. I think those of us who are, you know, we're about the truth, whatever that is. Public office does not exist so that one religion can be preached from a government pulpit, from school classrooms funded by public tax dollars. You know, we have to fight the indoctrination machine. And I haven't seen the headlines. I haven't followed him that much. But if this is indeed happening, I think we raise a stink and we do so as quickly as we can. I think it's being pushed mainly by the, uh, it's mainly being pushed by the, the people that, uh, the Hobby Lobby group, you know, they tried to do this in Mustang and then they withdrew it. And uh, so now they're trying to put this in as a bill to get it passed where they can actually teach it in schools as an elective, but they're going to teach it as history. Well, they te now are they teaching like this is historical literature, That's possibly what I don't know myth? That's sure how they're planning on doing it. I mean, I mean if they're teaching, mm -hmm. if it's a, a class like a world religions class and you're looking at it from a literary standpoint or like you would explore any other myth, but this being Oklahoma, I suspect there's probably something else going on. Have you noticed that in the political systems, they will introduce a bill, the bill gets shot down, they'll go back, reword it with the lawyers, they'll lawyerize it, come back, reintroduce it, it's shot down, they go back, and they come back about every 18 months. And uh, we, we've been, we'll continue to fight this for a while. But I'll tell you, I just, how many people, the atheist community of Tulsa, I came in here and I was like, well, how many members do you guys have? And a few hundred? And somebody threw out a number. How, how many are, are on your Facebook page? 1,400 people in Tulsa <laughs> are part of an atheist community. And that's just the people who actually clicked like or join or whatever. Think about how many lurkers are out there who are still sort of waiting for their chance to emerge. I think that kind of insanity is going to become harder and harder for those in government office. I think they backed off of it. Yeah, they yeah thanks to some of the national organizations. Okay, young lady on the wall just said that she thinks they backed off because they may have received some pressure from some national forces. Is there anybody else who would like to? The microphone's right here. Tell me your first name. My name's Rex. Hi, Rex. I'm 64, almost 65. The end of this month, in case anybody wants to send me a card or something. You look good. You look good. <laughs> uh, you got a good taxidermist. Yeah. <laughs> this is what this is what's left of Rex. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, about 50 years ago, I saw something similar to this happening, a big push of, of religion, particularly here. And at the time, I was a Baptist. But I also saw education and intelligence starting to push back, and Baptists kind of pushed back out of the mainstream. What appears to me to be happening is that if you've been following, a lot of the fundamentalist churches have been losing membership at, at an alarming rate. I think that's part of the, what the push is, is their panic of loss of control. I'm a humanist and a Unitarian, and at, the, uh, at All Souls, they set aside one area for the, for the humanist, which, by the way, is a nice way of saying most of us are atheists. They did not realize what kind of turnout we were getting. We're now outnumbering the other services. So there really is a turnout, and the humanist atheist interest is growing. We're gaining membership. So it's not just here. So I wonder what your thought is if this is panic on their part, oh, pushing yeah. back loss of control. Look, have you guys been watching Pat Robertson? Right? I mean, has he he was bad shit to begin with. Have you seen how absolutely his uh, every time he opens his mouth it becomes more and more insane? 
And this is not just true with Robertson, but many, many others. And I see it as, was it Matt Dillahunty who said something like, it's like, you know, a wounded animal often becomes more dangerous. Uh, they feel the reins of power slipping away. They feel that they now no longer control the conversation. The internet, information, education is setting people free. If somebody says something from the pulpit on Sunday at noon, at noon 05, anybody can pull up their smartphone and grab Google and pull up a reputable source and fact check it. And as that happens, you're starting to see more and more people sort of fall away. What happens? They become desperate. There are whole books being written about how to bring people back to the church, especially kids, teenagers. How do we win the youth? How do we bring children back? Well, that tells us that they are leaving or they never went to begin with. And uh, yeah, do I see a more secular nation every single year? Absolutely. But I do not think that we can be... uh, passive. I think they're going to get freakier. They're going to get crazier. They're going to become more desperate. And uh, we're going to have to fight some pretty ugly battles, I think, before we start to see some, uh, see the situation even out. I don't know. Would you agree, disagree? I'd welcome your your perspective or opinion. Pardon me? Yeah. The Unitarians, uh, intrigued me. I really do appreciate the inclusiveness and the fact that they, my first public outing, I came out as an atheist in his church, All Souls Unitarian Church in 20, it was 2011. Never shown my face before. I was terrified. I'd been working behind the scenes. The radio show had been on the air for a year and I feared consequences. What's going to happen to me? And uh, it was at All Souls Unitarian that I gave a presentation at the first Oklahoma Free Thought Convention. And the crowd was just amazing, just a gift. I'm sure you were all there, um, but the crowd was just amazing. And it, it, it reminded me that I was not alone. And that's kind of what I wanted this radio show to be. It was a reminder to people that they're not alone. I have questions back to the Unitarian sometimes about the inclusiveness of many Unitarian churches. Do many Unitarian churches, and I realize there are many flavors, but do they sort of treat every belief as it's on equal footing? You know, if somebody comes in and they're a flat earther, you know, sitting next to a round earther, does the Unitarian sort of philosophy give equal footing to each one of those? And I don't know if you want to answer that or not. uh, The basic Unitarian philosophy is that we have no philosophy or creed. So what do you talk about? I mean, if you have no philosophy or creed, what would a Sunday message be about? Okay, like, uh, well, we're going to have two Sunday messages tomorrow. One will be Dr. Robert Prynne, who, whose book was how he went from being a good Methodist minister to being a great atheist minister. Uh, <laughs> we also have uh, Carlton Pearson is, is oh, back over goodness. with us. So they, they take the, ra- the gamut, any, any honestly held viewpoint, you can be right or wrong, but as long as you're honest about it, you're you're treated with a respect. Make your presentation. Where did the evidence come from? But the one of the basic tenets is uh, to seek the seek the truth and love. That you don't attack someone just because they are they have a different idea. So it's essentially a, a forum for ideas. You yes, entertain a, different perspectives, and the audience can decide for themselves, kind of thing. Exactly. With a non-judgmental attitude, is that accurate? Non-judgment. I would say that is. We have like a, a traditional service at ten o'clock for those that are older and like a little more of the Christian type music. Uh, then they have uh, contemporary, which were most of those that came over from higher dimensions that like the livelier music. Then we have the humanist service running at the same time, which is more about philosophies. The one thing that I have noticed that I really like is you never hear about the eternal carrot and stick of heaven and hell. It's, you know, that there, that there may be something or maybe not. And it's more of just a community of thinkers. It surprised me the people that were members there, just everybody stays off the radar. Well, to their credit, they let a whole truckload of atheists in back in the <laughs> summer of 2011 for the, that amazing convention. So. Yeah, I can't speak for all the atheists because we don't have one voice. Yeah, yeah, you're right. How many people here participate, if you're comfortable raising your hand, in some kind of a service, like a church? I've got just a handful, three or four people here. 
How many people are slightly uncomfortable with the idea of associating yourself with a service or a church? Is there anybody? Quite a few, quite a few. What's that about? Is that because you don't want to appear religious? Look, I left one religion. I was part of one flock. I was a sheep. There, I refuse to join another flock. I mean, what drives that? Anybody want to speak to that? You'll need to speak into my microphone here because they, I want the radio audience. But that's something I'm curious about. We speak quite a bit about community. And I personally have come to a point where I get a little weird about the word church, atheist church. And I found after doing some digging that it was mostly the media that used the term church for Sunday assemblies or whatever it is that these meetings are called when non-believers get together and hang out. And uh, they'll hear motivational speakers. They enjoy music. And I was speaking. I did a show called The Copycats. It was a speech I gave at Apostacon in several other cities last fall. We talked about the fact that community is something that human beings do naturally. And what the church has done, and they do it very, very well, is they have created a model for community. And then they stamped a brand of ownership upon community. So you get together as a group. Oh, fine. Yeah, we did that. That's us. That's church. Oh, you guys enjoy communal music? Oh, yeah, we we did that. We do that, yeah. You guys hear a, a speaker that inspires you ed, or educates you? Yeah, we, we did that. We're the church. We did it first. Um, and so whenever we do what people do naturally, which is to come together as human beings, the church says, actually, we own that. And the truth is, is that this type of experience is not a church experience. It's a human experience. It was happening long before the church ever stepped in. And that's something I think we need to take back. Now, whatever you call it, I, I would like to encourage everybody, don't be nervous about doing something with a group. Just because you're doing something communally does not mean that you are being led like a sheep, that you are following someone or something in blind faith. In fact, anyone who's seen a free thought group like this knows that disagreement happens often, right? You guys don't look at the next person and just blindly say, amen. You actually often have spirited conversations about the right and wrong of it, what the evidence says, what the evidence doesn't say. And and sharpening each other's knives makes us better. We actually become more effective out there because we've challenged each other in this way. But we can come together in a meeting, in a group, in whatever, a convention, and not have to apologize to the church because the church didn't own it to begin with. Come on up, sir. Tell me your first name. Warren. Warren. I uh, grew up in a Southern Baptist church. We went to church every time there was church. Um, I think I had a lifetime of it by about 16 or 17 years old. So I'd, I'd had enough of church. And I've tried the Unitarian Church over and again. Over again. I went to Unitarian Church in Salt Lake City when, when I was living there. And uh, I felt the same thing here. That in to me, it was a little bit too welcoming to all different perspectives. All kinds of crazy. You said flat earthers. I don't. I never met one there, but there was plenty of well, others. I, was, I, I drew an extreme example. I'm sure there aren't any flat <laughs> earthers at the service tomorrow. But it just seemed to be too open to uh, every different idea to me, and and a bit too structured for me. I grew up in that structure of a church, and bad memories then. Well, yes and no. I have. There's some parts of church that I thought were uh, that I liked. I liked the music. I liked the uh, the uh, social suppers. The the uh, potluck dinners and so forth. Anybody in this room ever listen to Christian music because you used to? It's one, two, three people, four people listen, still listen today to Christian. You listen even now? Not on purpose. Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I was just scanning the radio. It was an accident. I, I was tuned in on the radio in the truck, listening to some music, <laughs> really enjoying the music. I can't hear lyrics anyway. I'm not good at discerning lyrics well you are luckier than you know in that way <laughs> and and my uh, daughter pointed out to me she said you're listening to a christian rock station and i go i don't care it's pretty good music that's funny that's <laughs> funny well thanks for sounding off my friend i do appreciate it do you have a hard time letting go of this christian stuff that you used to do back in the day like i can't enjoy christian music now because even if the tune sounds good it brings back memories of back when I was a believer, and I realize in my mind I'm doing it, the math in my head that actually, no, these lyrics are talking about something that's long been debunked, blah, 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 and it becomes this 
it, it just takes me completely out of the experience. I can't surrender to the music anymore. I know, does anyone have a perspective on that? Microphone's right here. Come on up. My name's Noble. What's up? Uh, my experience is now having been a street preacher here in Tulsa and going into pulpits in other cities nearby, I was hardcore. I would, I would call myself hardcore. I was a bus captain. I brought kids in. And it's only been about three years since I have deconverted. And I go through this process, and I wish I could claim the origin of this word, but I use the, the term unchurching myself. And I still feel like I hold on to some of the, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them values, but doctrines, the way I conduct myself, maybe not necessarily the way I speak, what I say, because I certainly have taken the atheist avenue and taken it, you know, full swing. Well, I think if you vet those things on their own merits instead of inheriting them or tying them into a theology, fine. I mean, as long as you came by them honestly, whatever. Right. You know, I mean, I think that's awesome. Right. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Oh, hey there. This is Christina Red. Congrats on the wonderful shows and keep it up. Mwah. Hi, this is Dale McGowan from Foundation Beyond Belief. You know, the best line I ever heard from a speaker at a free thought convention came from Seth Andrews at Free OK uh, about two years ago. Uh, he was introduced as the thinking atheist, and, and Seth immediately said, you know, my show is the thinking atheist, but I'm not the thinking atheist. I'm the dumbass who took 30 years to figure it out. It's that kind of self-deprecating intelligence that has made Seth stand out from the crowd and has made this show just one of the great bright lights in the movement. Congratulations. Congratulations on 200, Seth, and here's to 200 more. You know, it's funny how your life turns upside down or right side up whenever you walk away from religion. I used to be huge into the death penalty, right? You kill somebody, we'll kill you back. That kind of thinking, eye for an eye. And now I look at it differently. And I may or may not be right on the subject, but I'm not looking at it from an Old Testament perspective. I'm able to see it with new eyes. Non-heterosexuals used to be, I mean, my best friend, he was best man at my wedding. I've known him for 30 years. Wrote me a letter in the 90s informing me that he was gay. I was heartbroken, right? He is in rebellion against God. He's going to hell. How can I be friends with this man? You know, how can I have him as part of my life? And all of a sudden... After a period of about a year, an epiphany struck me, and I realized he was the same dude that I had grown up with. He's the same guy that I would trust with my, you know, I'd trust him with my ATM card, with my car keys, with my family, with my life. And I saw him in three dimensions. And, you know, I wonder if that may have been part of the seed that was sort of helped me over the next decade start to, to ask other questions. But I, I flipped, and I see it differently now. No, I was growing up, I don't know about you guys, I'm not a drug user, but, you know, we're locking people up for weed. Back then, it was like, oh my goodness, he was smoking a marijuana cigarette, it was just horrible, <laughs> right? And now you look at it and you're like, wait, there's a child rapist on the street, and there's murder, and there's crime, there's all this insanity, and you're putting, your tax dollars are putting people in jail for weed while hard liquor is legal? It just, and you see it through different eyes. The downside is when you see it through different eyes, you start to lose your faith in humanity, right? You start to just think, oh, this, the problems are so overwhelming. When you're not a binary thinker, yes, no, good, bad, good, evil, black, white, which is what religion does. And you see the nuance of the complexity of these situations, it's often overwhelming. I find it hugely overwhelming sometimes to sit back and see it in three dimensions. Come on up. I kind of have a statement as well as a question. My father just died January 1st. I'm so sorry. And my family is Catholic, very religious. And I did not attend the fam family stuff or the funeral. I did it because they don't understand how much, or religious people don't understand how much they put upon you. And I, I really kind of left the family nine years ago because of this. And 
I want to throw out the group. You know, I, I know I did wrong. I should have been there, but they don't. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't be there with it. So, was it a product? I mean, don't let me peer into your windows here. But was it because of how they had treated you? Did you, were you uh, ostracized for me being and a my non-believer? Did not have a good relationship, but the family, because of religion and my dad, kind of compounds. Yeah. Well, I'm very sorry about but the loss of But it's the religious your side of it because all of them. You know, I believe that dad's waiting in heaven for mom and, you know, the, the, uh, it was all Facebook posts and stuff. And and you yeah, just opted uh, out. It was just yeah, too much I just, for you. I just, couldn't, I just couldn't go there. So. All right. Well, I respect that. Thanks for and sharing. Just see what everybody else thought about, thought about it. All right. I mean, I'll attend a funeral in a church. I mean, it's for me, it's about the person. I was asked to videotape a funeral a few years ago because some of the family members could not be here. And they knew I was a professional videographer, so they said, look, would you come and shoot video of the presentations? And they were all about God and heaven and God and heaven. And, I mean, it was almost an evangelical atmosphere. And now we come back to time and place. I could have probably said to somebody standing next to me, you know, this is a load of crap, right? He died of a heart attack. Most of his family didn't get a chance to say goodbye. It was a horrible, senseless tragedy. And all the stuff that they are, all the mechanisms for coping they are building are obvious to those who care to look objective. I could have done that, but it was the wrong place, the wrong time, right? Uh, Who was it on the radio who said, my tragedy is not your soapbox? And I believe that. I mean, there is a time and a place, and so I walked away. But I understand the challenges many face when it comes to religious services like that. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry that you weren't there for your father. Uh, Anybody else want to chime in? Come on up. Very briefly, 25 years out of the country, I lived in in parts of Asia and in Scandinavia. I came back to the States to take care of my mom in her last days. She was a, I'm a recovering Catholic, and she was a convert at age 16. Um, I've been Buddhist for over, I'll be 71 coming up in March. I've been Buddhist for over 50 years. I helped start a hospice in Ponca City, where Joe and I live. After my mom passed, uh, they had two people, and I helped build it up, and I worked there for 17 years. Death and dying, bedside with people over 100 in their last moments. During that time, I met a preacher, and this is an uplifting story I think you'll enjoy, because I've been to a lot of groups like this, and it becomes very obvious to me that, that change is a personal thing, and We're not going to have a major demonstration, by God, we're atheists. We're going to do it on an individual basis with each person we talk to. And it depends on how we we come in there with an axe to grind. We're going to have an axe thrown back at us. One of the preachers uh, that was involved in hospice, he was on the board of directors, and a very nice guy, I'll call him Frank. Um, Frank was a Christian minister, and he and I had our moments where we would discuss these things, because I was Buddhist atheist, and he was solid Christian. Um, When he retired, he and his wife, he's a musician, he plays guitar, she plays bass, and they do religious songs, they write their own religious music, and they travel around the Midwest and sing at gatherings. In Ponca City, there's a place called Gospel Jubilee, and Gospel Jubilee, as you can well imagine, is musicians that come and sing gospel music. Well, Frank and his wife were doing this on a regular basis. And we have these little tete-a-tetes on Facebook from time to time, but we're still good friends. He wrote me the other day that the guy that runs Gospel Jubilee had gotten into his Facebook and realized that Frank was for gay marriage. He pulled Frank and his wife aside and said, you can't play here anymore. So this was like a slap upside the head. So Frank and I met the other day, and I said, how's it feel? And he's, he's, at this, he's at this spot. This was a solid Christian minister, but he's at this, he's on the edge now a little bit. And I'm not going to, of course, push him anyway, but it's interesting to watch. And that, to me, was like, I think that the religious conservatives and the really, I call them fascist religios, that they eventually ruin themselves. They work themselves into a corner. This guy, what's he doing going on, on Frank's Facebook? 
simply to find out that there was a little moral issue that he had problem with. So Frank, you're out of here. Well, Frank's like, well, what the hell happened there? I thought I was doing a good thing here, but obviously not. And because it was sort of organic, right? It's something that originated from him on a journey he himself was taking, yeah. right? That's interesting. Yeah. But, you know, it's to me, it's it, personally, you were talking about talking to people. You know, I what I try to do is sow a little seed and then back up and let that seed possibly grow. Maybe not. If I meet the person again in a couple of weeks, the question might come up. Maybe that seed is taken, you know. But again, aggressive, my God. Yeah, I, I get it. Your religion sucks, and I'm an atheist, and screw you. No. Yeah, you you're dumb. I'm right smart. Back. You know, it's that kind be, of thing it's is be a general, a general seed sowing. Well done. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for sounding off. I appreciate it. I had Dr. Uh, Peter Bogosian on the air uh, recently on his book called "The Manual for Creating Atheists." So he talked about street epistemology and how you can use the Socratic method, asking questions. Questions are awesome. Because you're not making a declarative statement. You don't go up to someone and say, Noah's Ark is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You say, how did penguins walk 8,000 miles to board a boat in the middle of the desert built by a 600-year-old guy? <laughs> and then you ask it pleasantly. Can you explain this to me? And then they had to walk back. And then they, how did they get back? Yeah. And... When you see people start to try to connect the dots and rationalize, and they often will get frustrated, which is a sign we are winning. And I think those types of things will fester. Might be weeks, months, maybe years, maybe decades. But I think if we continue to ask very good questions, if nothing else, it pops them out of fundamentalism into this weird deism. Have you noticed that that's sort of the journey, right? You're fundamentalist. I believe the Bible is the absolute perfect Jesus Christ word of God. And then it becomes a little inconvenient. So they step back and say, well, you know, part of it's for today, part of it's for yesterday. And when that stops working, they say, well, forget the Old Testament, read the New Testament. And when that doesn't work out, they say, well, you know what? I don't really follow the Bible. I have a relationship with Jesus. And when that doesn't work out, then they end up in this sort of weird membrane out here that's really nothing more than deism. Well, you know, I think God, something's out there. Something did all of this, and that's where most people hang out. It's a nice, safe spot. And I can handle those people. Look, you and I aren't doing battle in the, uh, in the school system over the deists. We're talking about the touchy-feely kumbaya nebulous god who spun the cosmos and then just disappeared. We can handle that. Yeah. So I, I think the more we can sort of uh, use questions to get people to that area and some will take the next step into non-belief and some won't but if we can get them out of fundamentalism we'll be doing ourselves a favor come on up tell me your name hello i'm dalton what's up um on what you were talking about earlier does anybody still listen to christian music why and why not and things like that <clears throat> i grew up in a youth group played in the youth group band didn't really like the music then just played it anyway it was a social behavior um since then after becoming atheist i find it increasingly difficult to listen to listen to Christian music for just knowing the harm and when I, a lot of people talk about harm that religion does but not a lot of people really get to see it uh, so I have a very good friend of mine who has Parkinson's disease he's a very devout Christian he believes with all that he is that God has cursed him for some transgression he did in his youth I couldn't imagine ever walking around feeling like there was a deity and he hates me he believes God gave him Parkinson's? to As a punishment for a past transgression, which he does not know of. Does he come from some kind of just crazy evangelical home, or they what? They speak in tongues, and somebody translates at church. Pentecostal. <laughs> oh. Someone will stand up and speak in tongues, then someone will stand up and translate. I get it. It's, yeah. Hey, that whole culture is, talk about an emotion-based culture, much more than the Baptists, the, the Lutherans. Certainly the Catholics. And uh, uh, go one, ahead. one question of a friend of mine who's kind of helped lead me out of the deism part into the atheism, atheism position. Um, I know he's getting the quote from somebody else. And I'm embarrassed that I can't tell you who the actual quote is. I'm sure somebody in this room knows. Um, he would always say, you can't reason somebody out of something they weren't reasoned into from the beginning. I was wondering if you had a, I don't agree. I, I disagree with that as well. I said, no, if anybody else had any. I mean, you guys can sound off if you want. I, I was reasoned out of my faith. 
I was reasoned out of my faith. I finally was able to put the fear away, the fear of asking questions. And that's always what I say to people. I'm not claiming to know the answer. I'm saying it's okay to ask that question. Another conversation stopper that you and I often hear out there in the debate arena is, who do you think you are to question God? Who are you? You are his creation. You you exist to serve him. Now, it's hugely presumptuous because they are in essentially a, a situation where they cannot be challenged, right? God exists, and you're not qualified to ask whether or not God exists. Well, that's really convenient. Could you ask who are you to be in a position to tell me that I can't ask questions because you are merely a creation as well? I usually Maybe. say, you know, why did you choose your specific deity over another <coughs> deity? And I'll list the names of several <coughs> other deities. Well, you apparently, did you use a reasoning process? Some, there was something that happened to you that made you choose one deity over the other. Uh, and then, of course, we get into the hide-and-seek champion of the universe argument where, you know, <laughs> God has essentially created himself and then turned the entire salvation equation into the hardest Rubik's Cube ever created. But I was reasoned out of my faith. You know, I was talking to Matt Dillahunty. I mentioned him earlier. He was going to be a Southern Baptist minister. He was reasoned out of his faith. You'll find stories everywhere of people who just got to a point where they were able to accept the info and they saw the evidence more objectively, and they said, you know, this makes more sense than what I used to believe, and they reasoned their way out. So, no, I absolutely disagree with that statement. Because one of the things that kind of set me on my path is I had a, a supervisor at one of my jobs that was sitting and reading the Bible, and he was having an issue with dinosaurs, and he kept saying, if dinosaurs exist, then the Bible is wrong. And we had this big discussion about it, and he doesn't believe dinosaurs well, he, exist? He wants to believe in dinosaurs because he's been to a museum and he's seen the, he's seen the skeletons wait, wait a minute, and the fossils. Wait a but he's, he's struggling been, with he's it been because to he's a like, museum. I've seen those and I've, the Bible, and he, he couldn't make sense of it. And he just kind of says, well, the dinosaurs have to be fake. Like he just wants to hold on to it like that that much. I was like thinking, oh. and I never gave it any thought. I got Again, nothing. I thought cool dinosaurs. I got right. nothing. You know, I mean, if you walk into... The, you know, if you it's if you walk, walk in and see dinosaur it. bones and go, Satan did it. Nah, no, nah, I don't think so. You know, they're probably you know, maybe that person cannot be reasoned out of their faith. Maybe, maybe that was know. the where where the quote comes from. I don't know. Thanks for Thank coming out, much. my friend. I appreciate it. Hey, this is Richard Carrier from California, and I'm using my PhD in ancient history to celebrate the 200th podcast of The Thinking Atheist by casting an ancient Greek spell that will guarantee 200 more. Hey, sexy listeners. This is Daryl Ray of the Secular Sexuality Podcast and author of Sex and God and the God Virus. Congratulations to Seth Andrews and The Thinking Atheist Podcast for 200 episodes love the work you do seth keep it up pun kind of intended tell me your first name sir oh i'm bob hi bob uh neil degrasse tyson uh, asked the question uh well actually he made the statement the question is not why are 85 percent of the national science academy members atheists is uh why aren't the other 15%? And that's a question I'd like to pose to you. Did he really say that? It was 95. That's interesting. Well, you know, the National Academy of Sciences number is, there have been some explorations done on that statistic. The number I heard was 93%. But if you look at the data, and it's complex data, it's not statistically factual to say that 93% are atheists. They don't believe in God. There are varying degrees of either deistic belief or agnosticism or whatnot in there. So the 93, it's a fun number to throw out. It was Hemet Mehta who did a presentation in Florida last year, and he was talking, I think, about this very statistic. We have to look at it. Now, the numbers are still really, really good. But there are a great many people who are scientists who do hold to a faith of some kind, almost always, in my opinion, born of uh, family and culture. But I don't uh, think the 93% number is one we can hang our hat on. We probably have to take a, a wider look at that particular stat. Okay. Uh, 
uh, instead of 7% uh, uh, believers, uh, you know, let's say it's 30%. Why are those 30% these uh, great minds that could do more science in their sleep than all but a few of us here could do during our waking hours? Why is Francis Collins of the Human Genome Project, who essentially proved that we are evolved creatures, why is he still an evangelical Christian? Hell if I know. <laughs> Other than it gives him comfort and it alleviates his fear of death and it's what he's always known and it's part of his culture and he doesn't want to let it go. It makes him happy. These are the answers I would think. Uh, the question is, are you a believer first or are you a scientist first? It's like if you go to Answers in Genesis or the Creation Institute and you look on their website to be a PhD and they go out and look for these cats to be on their boards and, and to represent them publicly, they will say... We need references, not from other scientists, but from at least two pastors. And you have to sign a statement which says that you are prepared to reject any scientific finding that does not line up with Scripture. Well, how could any scientist sign such a, an agreement? I refuse to accept any quote-unquote science that does not line up with Scripture. Once you've declared that, in my mind, you are not a real scientist. Well, speaking of uh, which, you mentioned your views changing on uh, capital punishment. Yeah. You know, if you look at the evidence on the effectiveness of capital punishment, uh, the evidence doesn't support it. Do you see your transition and your view on capital punishment as a embracing, going from the religious point of view to embracing the scientific point of view? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was a lot about the data for me. It was, you know, by the time, it, first of all, it, to me, it's a human rights issue. You know, if, if they are that dangerous, lock them up. Hard labor, great. You know, we don't have to execute them. Also, when you get into the appeals process, it's often more expensive to put somebody on death row than it is to give them life in prison. I'm not convinced that the people on death row have all been given a fair trial. You know, many of them convicted before the use of DNA evidence. I think there are so many things that can go wrong. If we're talking about a human life, I myself I don't think we have to kill them. I think, uh, you know, let's try them, let's retry them, let's protect the public, but we don't have to become killers in order to be effective at doing so. And that's kind of how I got there. Okay? Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. All right. Was there one more? Or are we done? Come on up. Come on up. Tell me your first name. All right, uh, Joey. Hi, Joey. What's up? All right. Um, this is a little bit off the topic of what we've been going on, but it's... Still kind of like an atheist thing. It's all right. So uh, I used to be Catholic. I was growing up like all my life until I was about, I think, 14 or 15. And I'm only 19 now, so it wasn't too long ago. But uh, this is something I'm kind of ashamed of is what, what brought me to atheism. Even though it's, it was such a good thing, I'm like really glad I, it did happen. But it was like that zeitgeist type stuff. You know, you heard about you've heard about Zeitgeist. The film? Yeah, not like the really bad fact checked and really <sighs> yeah, not good boy. information. And, and even even right when I started to, I was kind of into that. Uh, government did the nine eleven and stuff like that, which which is kind of what I I'm really ashamed of, like thinking of that kind of stuff because it is now now that I see it now. Well, There's no like reason to be really, ashamed. Yeah, dude. I know. I mean, I'm glad it brought me to atheism and stuff like that, but it's kind of. Really crappy stuff. If nothing else, it sounds like the zeitgeist experience, that the film and those types of questions got you in a sort of a mode of exploration, of challenge. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. If you think it's like, it's, if it, I know it's like a bad film with all that kind of stuff, but oh, do you think yeah. it's good in like opening people's minds a little bit? Because I, I don't. You don't not, think not I, I get enough hate it. mail as it is. Yeah. You're going to have me talk about zeitgeist. Yeah, because I mean, I, I think it, I, I've watched it again and it's, it's a lot of it's a load of crap. Well, and, and it's guys for me is a challenge. Now, I've only seen the first film. It's a compelling piece uh, that's quoted often, and they make a lot of, like, uh, um, they do a lot of 9-11 conspiracy stuff. They make direct connections to Jesus and Horus, which are really not grounded in the evidence. And, yeah. and uh, you know, the challenge is, is that I can't recommend it to someone else because— there are non-truths in it, and there are better ways to get the information. And another thing that kind of irritates me is if the Zeitgeist producers had done something, geez, you know, I've had a video go out, 
and there'll be something factually wrong. And it takes this community about nine seconds to discover that I screwed up. Here's a great example. Yeah. I did, I was talking about how that humankind used to think the earth was flat, but now we know that the earth is round. No, 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 no. The earth is not round. As soon as I put that video up, a steamroller of unbelievable like science was was thrown at me this is not a it's not round this is an oblate spheroid well <laughs> and i went back and i corrected the information and deleted the old and reposted the video right i if zeitgeist had gone in if the producers had gone in and taken the stuff that has been debunked and refitted and done what good science does i would be waving their banner but instead they've kind of doubled down and so i th i just think there are better ways to get people talking and thinking than the zeitgeist films and uh, i know everyone there are people out there who are fans of zeitgeist who are going to come after me fine uh you know Shermer's done some great work skeptic magazine's got a, an expose of the 9-11 claims it's fantastic popular mechanics did a rundown of 9-11 looking at many of the claims of films like zeitgeist and loose change and whatnot i mean the information is there for anyone who cares to look and uh so i myself i'm not a fan yeah. okay that's why I'm, I'm glad i got more into this type of community and got further away from that i mean i'm, I'm happy that it got me to where i'm at but i wouldn't like like you said i wouldn't recommend it to anybody i'm glad else, you made it I'm out just... of catholicism man you know you yeah. <laughs> you got away from that catholic guilt that i keep hearing yeah. about from everybody i, I so. still have some of it from my family a little bit it's like it's it's always from a certain a member of mine is oh well you should uh, you should uh, get your um oh what is it called uh, it's like the final blessing thing of Catholicism uh, what's what? the final blessing of Catholicism which one is it Last something like that it said you should do it just in case just in case this is a phase of yours you should go do it and so so you'll be okay in the future just just go do it just just come with me we're doing it on Sunday so. You should come just in case it's a face. Some kind of weird confirmation or baptism. Yeah, confirmation, that's what it's called. Yeah, to make yep. sure that. Uh, yep. Make it. sure, yeah, yeah. Why don't you next time you? No, you know what? Don't. <laughs> I was going to say next time you're talking, why don't you ask him about how the the uh, the wine and the bread turns to Jesus's flesh and blood at the moment of communion to see how that. Ask him explain the physics of that. That ought to be funny. But no, 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 don't don't oh, yeah, do no, that. No, no. Don't do that. <laughs> well, just look around the room, my friend. Remember that you are not alone. All right, you are not alone. All right, man. Thank you so much. Hey, this is Matt Dillahunty from the Atheist Experience TV show, and I'd like to congratulate my friend Seth Andrews on the 200th podcast of The Thinking Atheist. I'd also like to congratulate you, the listeners, for listening, supporting, and helping to make our community better every single day. Here's hoping we share another 200 episodes in a lifetime of helping people embrace reality, reason, and rationality. I took the liberty of kind of looking at some of the milestones of the last 200 episodes. 200 doesn't sound like a lot to a lot of people, but to me, to a guy who just started doing this show out of his home office because he felt like he was by himself and, and wanted some community and wanted to try to be a broadcaster again. I left radio in 2004. The industry being a shrinking industry, I segued into video. I thought I'd done my last radio show a, a decade or more than a decade ago. So the honor of being able to do radio again, and I, I was looking back at the milestones. You know, that very first broadcast we did was July the 31st, 2010. R.N. Raw was my special guest. I didn't know who the flip he was. Somebody said, you should have R.N. Raw on the radio. Who's R.N. Raw? I had no idea. He has a YouTube channel. Really? Cool. I go and I see some of his work, and I think, this guy's freaking smart. And so I send him a message out of the blue. He doesn't know me from Adam. And he says, sure, I'll be on the show. And he does a kick-ass broadcast. Now, the audio fidelity of the old shows is pretty bad. We were still navigating blog talk radio in my own studio. And if you go back that far, you know what? Don't. Don't go back. <laughs> the, the audio, there are better shows. There's higher quality in the, most, in the more recent years. But just to hear him speak, I thought, God, he's, he's just whip smart. He loves people and he has a passion for the evidence. It was in August of that year, Dan Barker came on the radio. It was his book, Godless, when I was coming out of my own faith that I read. This guy was a pastor, right? Talk about Pentecostal evangelical. He was hardcore and he managed to escape. And he's now running the show or one of the people running the show at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. We had our first facepalm show in 2010. You guys know what a facepalm is, right? 
palm to the face because something's so insane. Mr. Deity joined us in November. We did a show about crazy cults in April of 2011. Thunderfoot joined us shortly after that. We did Free OK. The audio of that speech is online for the summer of 2011. We remembered Christopher Hitchens. There's a guy that I sorely miss. His voice is tremendously missed. I don't deify the man. I realize he was a flawed human being. But the guy was fearless. And he was there. His stuff, his voice, his works, his videos, his debates, his presence was there at a critical moment when I, I just felt like my whole world had been rocked. And I was terrified. And I saw him speak totally without fear. And it just gave me courage. And I will carry that with me forever. The day he passed away was just a, and that was a sad day. I don't do a lot of that kind of thing over famous figures, you know. But I really felt it in my bones. You guys catch that? That day when the news was broadcast? We talked about the clergy project, religion and sexuality. James Randi, the amazing Randi, was kind enough to come on the radio and talk about the faith healers. Atheist teenagers, atheist weddings, atheist funerals. We've done shows about those. We talked to the son of Fred Phelps of Westboro, Nathan Phelps, about the, the insanity going on at Westboro Baptist Church. We talked to the high priest of the Church of Satan one October. How funky is that? Hi, I'm with an atheist radio show. I'd like to know if the high priest of the Church of Satan would like to do a radio show. And they said, okay. And he came on the radio with us. We talked to pastors, ex-pastors, apologists, listeners from across the planet. We've explored various religions and beliefs. We've talked about Mormonism. Got an ex-Mormon in the audience. I know that. Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology. We talked about politics, the psychology of belief, whether or not there was a real Jesus. Talk about something that the free thought community continues to debate and explore. Humanism, charity, helping other people. We had Dr. Porco on, Carolyn Porco, talking about the Cassini missions to Mars. Have you been following this story about the crazy stuff that we're doing in outer space? We landed on a comet just a short while ago. We did the annual Ghost Stories podcast, which has become a thing. We sit around the virtual campfire and tell stories. And most importantly, letters from all over from people who speak personally about how the show has impacted their lives. Preparing today's broadcast has been difficult. Charlie Hebdo obviously is on everybody's lips. And for those who are listening to this broadcast in archive, we're talking about the French satirical weekly newspaper, long known for seriously lampooning religion, Islam included, Islam especially. Over the years, unflattering caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad have outraged many. Their November 3rd, 2011 issue was satirically guest edited by Muhammad himself, <laughs> depicting the prophet on the front cover with a caption that said, 100 lashes of the whip if you don't die laughing. These guys were fearless. Fearless. That same month, their office was firebombed and its website was hacked. January 7th, 2015, just a few days ago. Three gunmen opened fire at the Paris office of the newspaper, killing a dozen people and wounding many others. Now, the cartoonists who had mocked the Prophet Muhammad were specifically targeted for execution. According to the BBC and many others, witnesses heard one of the shooters proclaiming, God is great and we have avenged the Prophet Muhammad. And the world has rallied around Charlie Hebdo. It's been interesting. Not as much as I'd like in the American media, French publications, Radio France, even Google have pledged financial support to the newspaper. Those cartoons that were so offensive to the murderers are being reposted, reprinted, rebroadcast across social media. And the magazine has said they're going to continue with the next issue as planned. And instead of the usual circulation of 45,000, oh, let's call it a cool one million issues. The story really speaks to so many things that you and I are up against. I mean, we talk about the challenges we have, but well, I tell you, in the, in the shadow of radical Islam, it's just a whole new level of insanity out there. The oppression of ideas, free speech, even unpopular speech, the power and the necessity of satire. 
Words like respect and sacred get tossed around. In a world where a death cult celebrates homicide and suicide. I think even now, more than ever, I think we feel a tremendous sense of obligation to speak our minds out there and to support rationality over insanity and to see the damage that religion does, whether fundamental or moderate or whatever. It's a falsehood. It is not supported by the evidence. It harms people. It distracts people from better answers. We should evolve past this, and they will not go quietly. So I'll be curious to see what happens in the weeks and the months and the years ahead. It's a scary time. It's an exciting time. But I'm glad that we are in this together. I wanted to finish the show with an email I got from a young lady named Nicole that I thought might encourage all of you, okay? And with her permission, I'd like to share these words. For our 200th broadcast, she said this. Since your 200th episode is fast approaching, I thought it'd be an appropriate time to tell you that your podcast has immensely impacted my life. I'm 20 years old, and like you, I was raised in a Christian home. Never taught by my parents how to think for myself. Exposure to public school and some awesome atheist agnostic friends were enough to plant that small seed of doubt in my mind. And throughout my high school and college years, that seed sprouted and bloomed into a beautiful, but sadly small, flower of reasoning. When I realized I was pansexual and started dating my current girlfriend, it was just about all over between me and my religion. However, I had plenty of cognitive dissonance to keep it at a distance. I was severely lacking in resources, and I wasn't sure where to start. One day, a few months ago, I stumbled across an article listing several reasons to doubt the historical existence of Jesus. In it was mentioned a website called xchristian.net. I didn't spend much time on the website when I found out it had a podcast, and it hit me. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. I work at a warehouse where we're allowed to spend our eight-hour shifts listening to music. I'd already invested in a couple podcasts and audiobooks as soon as I realized there must be atheist skeptical podcasts. I'm honestly still ashamed it took me so long. I went straight to iTunes. I started with three reasonable doubts, a podcast run from Grand Rapids, Michigan, The Atheist Experience, and yours, The Thinking Atheist. Yours was my favorite, and suddenly I was listening to five or six episodes a day. I couldn't stop. You've presented it in such an enchanting way, your charismatic voice, your charming sense of humor, and your ability to have fun with what you can do, simply drew me in. Even all your anecdotes about your amazing wife, seriously, what a woman, and she is. Your cat, and of course, rat dog, made it relatable and personal. I almost bought rat dog to the, to the event today, by the way. But didn't know what the authorities at the facility would say about an animal, a critter running around here. Nicole said, It was so refreshing to finally receive validation from my doubts, to realize just how illogical and contradictory religion is. Having been sheltered for most of my life and having not known anyone in my life who went through what I did, that is, left religion, it was such a great feeling to finally hear someone who understood, and that's not all. A couple episodes in, I started writing down all the references you made to other books that helped you through your journey, books like The God Delusion, and other references like Julia Sweeney's Letting Go of God. The list grew longer and longer and is still growing, even as I crossed off several. Aaron Ra's foundational falsehoods of creationism, religious, and most importantly in my journey, I believe, Dr. Jerry Coyne's Why Evolution is True. I say it's the most important for me because it got me interested in the realm of evolutionary biology, more specifically, paleontology. Having been raised to ignore scientific facts in that particular field, I dove headfirst into it. It's only been a month or two, but I'm so enamored by this field that I have decided I'm going to change my major and study paleontology. I'd love to publish an illustrated book about transitional fossils one day. Maybe then creationists will stop claiming that they don't exist. I'm sorry this was such a lengthy email, but I just wanted you to know that you've essentially turned my life into a whole new direction. I've been struggling for some time to figure out what I want to do with my life, and you helped me to figure it out. I just wanted to say thank you, and please keep doing what you do, always yours. 
Nicole. Is that freaking amazing or what? You ever in activism hit a valley and you just think, I'm tired. I feel like I'm having the same arguments every five minutes. Nothing is getting done. Nothing changes. Year after year after year, I've had those moments. I read something like that. It'd take the National Guard to keep me from doing the next radio show. You know what I'm saying? You are making a difference. We are making a difference. These conversations we're having are making a difference. And while I have a microphone and some flashy toys, it is the work of all of us that is making this happen. These inroads against superstition happen. And you are to be congratulated for the brave stand that you are taking out there in this often crazy world. Thank you so much for being a part of my 200th broadcast today. It's been a real, real honor. Thank you. Broadcast today brought to you by NatureBox.com. Wholesome, delicious, great tasting snacks, delicious treats like honey Dijon pretzels. Go to NatureBox.com slash Thinking Atheist. NatureBox.com slash Thinking Atheist. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com